Um, I'm Silvana Pietro Semoli, and I will explain my Italian name and last name. Uh, my parents were Italian immigrants. My dad went to Venezuela to work for the oil industry. And he was very passionate about agriculture. So he had a lane hand farm and we did grow up there. So my background had been influenced by uh, living in a farm. And um, after a while, he, he was uh, having an integrated farm. And it was struggling, and he decided to close the farm. And after some time, he bought two cattle farms. So I have experience in poultry and cattle. And of course, this influenced my career selection and I ended as an animal scientist. And I did start working with forages. Of course, as we were in Venezuela, and this is a northern hemisphere, but we are tropical area. Uh, my experience is mostly with tropical forages. And um, I, I always had uh, this interest in doing things out of the box. So I was trying to find um, natural dewormers and I did start working with the neem tree. Mm. Um, we did use the seeds and the leaves to prepare aquos extract to control flies and ticks, and also gastrointestinal parasites. As the seeds and, uh, were seasonal, I was thinking, oh, maybe we can do something with the leaves, because we have the leaves all year around. And then uh, I did start preparing multinutritional blocks. And I was feeding uh, cattle with these uh, blocks with neem leaves and it did work. We were able to control um, most of gastrointestinal parasites. Uh, I had also interest in doing other stuff, so I was working with earthworms, California earthworms in vermicompost. I, I always was thinking we could um, feed livestock with them because they have a very high uh, protein content, but I was never able to produce the, the amount that I needed to grow some animals. I uh, did work with quails and it did it work very well, but not other kind of animals. And also I was interested um, in alternative feed. So we were preparing a meal using uh, sweet potato leaves, actually vines, com the complete vine, including the leaves and the roots. And we were preparing a meal uh, to feed um, pigs. And we were testing grow rate. And we were... Um, we tested also carcass and pork quality, and we were able to substitute part of the concentrate using this uh, sweet potato meal. And then, I'm, uh, um, since I moved to North Carolina, I have been working at the Center for Environmental Farming System with outdoor swine production, trying to uh, minimize the environmental impact of this production system. So today I would like to, to present some models, some strategies that have proven uh, satis satisfactory to improve the sustainability of the production, uh, uh, pasture pig production systems. As we have a limited time and I tend to speak too much, uh, 
I apologize in advance, and maybe I will need to skip some slides. I promise I will only skip those slides with words that are hard to pronounce. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, we are living in, in time of constant changes. And these changes affect farmers. So I was, for this conference, I was trying to find out what makes some farmers be successful and what, why some farmers are not. And then I, I, I found out that there are huge amount of forces that impact farmers. And the way that farmers face these forces shape their production system in a way that some will do better than others. So if we make a summary of uh, successful farmers, we will find that usually they are flexible, resilient, they adopt innovative approaches, and so on, so on. But even Cinderella, she knew that there are no one size fit all solution. Every farm will have in, uh, their own qualities, their own circumstances, and they will um, face environment and we'll find sol uh, different solutions. So we will see uh, different strategies, strategies that can be implemented in the search of sustainability. And I will focus in four of them. The first of, of them is make a better use of local resources. Merge new technologies, but never, never forget traditional uh, technologies. We need to, to improve the efficiencies of our resources. We, we, we can uh, do that for our animals or for our uh, supply chains. And we need to implement best uh, management practices. In genetic, it's very important. Uh, we need to work a lot with genetic. We need to improve our animals. Uh, Dr. Talbot, he mentioned something about this. We have, uh, usually, we need to, to focus in two uh, directions. One of them is to focus on adapted animals. And usually, heritage breeds are better adapted but also we need to have productive animals. So we, we have to focus. And we will face the dilemma. Should I work with pure animal? Should I work with crossbred? If we, uh, if we are working for niche market and we are exploring what Dr. Talbot mentioned about meat quality, is maybe is, is more useful to work with uh, pure bread. And if we are working in that way, we have to be very, very careful to control inbreeding because usually our population will, will be small and we can have problems with inbreeding. But we need to keep the biodiversity. We need to have biodiversity among breed, breeds, but also inside the same breed. We need diversity to have better adapted animals. Another aspect that I have found that my farmers, or the farmers I have been working, one problem they, they usually have is a high mortality rate with piglets usually by, uh, as a result of being crushed by the mom. It's very, very important for 
people working outdoor to select by maternal ability. This is not a trait of importance in conventional swine production, but for us it's very, very important. So try to select better mothers, those that will be uh, uh, taking better care of the piglets. Beside that, it's very important also optimize the shelter, the hot where we, the farrowing hot. It's very important the area, the size of the hut, and provide some protection to the piglets, like rails, slope way, uh, walls, um, raised bar, all that help, and also to provide uh, bedding. I think you mentioned bedding, but both of you. come up. Another thing is something that I have, and this, this is a shame. I feel guilty, but I use like to punish myself. This happened in one of my experiments. I went one day and I found this. We are losing money and we are leaving nutrients in the ground. This should not happen. But we also need to improve the feed efficiency of, of our animals, and we will find this through genetic. And also, uh, there are some feeding, feeding strategies we can implement. We can go from one uh, diet to phase diet, if we find that uh, convenient. We can split our herd and manage uh, females in one paddock and males in, in another paddock and that will help also because they, are, they have different grow rates and that will help us to save money. So that is, a little, is something that is very easy to do and will help to improve. Um, we need to find ways to feed animals uh, with feed stuff that do not compete with humans. I know here it's, it's very easy to grow corn, but in countries like my country, uh, corn is an important staple for human. So we cannot compute, it's not fair, feeding animals for some, with something that can be used for human and it's more expensive also. So we need to find, and there are many, many alternatives feed that can be used and, and without affecting, without impacting uh, animal production. And um, these pictures, uh, this comes from California. I had the opportunity to work there and I was amazed. They were almost paying nothing because they were using a lot, a lot of waste for feeding pigs. And this picture is from North Carolina. I had the, yeah? Aren't you conserving your feeding of the A oh, good question, yes. That is a high, yes, that's a, a risk. So you have to be careful. Good, good point. Um, we have to be careful about potential contamination and also we can have an impact on animal growth, carcass, and poor quality, so we have to be careful. One of the complaints that uh, I heard in California where it was that the processor was saying the quality was, the, the, the pork and car, uh, carcass quality was not constant, so they, they were wishing, okay, I wish they will keep the quality, but as they were changing the feedstock, they had problems. This picture is very interesting. It's from North Carolina. This farmer, he goes around farmer market and he uh, grabs all the, the feedstock that have, they, they feed the food, fruits, 
and things that can be used for the pigs, and he's using it. But he's so smart that he is also using the boxes. So he, he sells the boxes, like the hardwood, the uh, hard paper of the boxes. So he's making money also with that. We have uh, the option in our farms to plant multi-species forages. I have been working with perennials, but mostly grasses. But here the, the uh, idea is to use a mixture of different. We can use grasses, legumes, brassicas, chicory, any uh, uh, grass, legume, or herbs. There are many advantages of have these species together in the same paddock. Uh, we will have a longer growing season. Uh, some species, as they have a growing, different growing habits, they can explore deeper in the soil than others, so they can use better the nutrients, they can use better the, the water, and um, the quality of the, of the forage that we will offer to the animals is different. In, the, in here, in this picture, we have, this is from North Carolina, we have barley and Austrian winter pea, and you can see how the animals selectively they, they grab the, the legume that has a better, better quality. And in this picture in the bottom, this picture is from Uruguay, we have a mixture of ryegrass, chicory, and clover, and we have a, a heritage breed from from Uruguay. Uh, there are strategies that will help us to make a better use of the forages. The first thing is to offer, like you do in your farm, is, is to offer frequently new areas. In that way, they will explore and they will, they will make a, a, a better consumption of the forage. And the other option is to restrict uh, the concentrate that we are offering them. But we have to be careful. To avoid impact on animal performers, if we are working with growing pigs, uh, we should not do a restriction bigger, bigger than 20 or 30 percent of the regular feeding rate. If we are working with replacement gilts, uh, don't do it bigger than 30%, and for lactating sows, less than 25%. So, talking about pasture management, one factor of very, uh, very important is uh, stocking rate. And uh, we had been working at CEFs with different forage species, and we will offer this like a reference. If we are working with annuals, we can have between 10 and 20 uh, growers per acre, and two to four sows with litter. If we are working with perennials, we can have a higher uh, stocking rate. If we are working with natural vegetation, oh my gosh, uh, four to 10, we have to, to, be, to have lower stocking rate. I will uh, try to go faster. We have um, tested a rotational system at CEFs. What we did, we divided our um, paddock in nine sections. We use the central area as heavy use area. We have the shelter there, the water there, and we have the feeder in one of the other section and we were moving the animals. Uh, the animals had access to the central area uh, to one paddock um, during one week and we were moving the animals after one cycle, we will remove one of, the, one of the fences 
and we will have uh, for and and this is very flexible you can have uh, more than one cycle and things this is uh, how you will see uh, that system in the field we have here the animals were moved yesterday here so here there is only one day of occupation this paddock here had one week rest and this one has one day rest and the animals have access to the central area uh, during whole time you can see here the difference this area has not been uh, grazed yet, and this has uh, how many? Three weeks rest, and you can see uh, how the forage is using part of the nutrients that have been deposited by the pigs. Uh, we tested the continuous system, that is what we usually do with the rotational stocking we already talked and a rotational strip where we were moving everything like they do uh, the shelter and everything once a week and you can see here um, how change the, the uh, ground cover and uh, the red and the green uh, colors are the two rotational systems. The green is the strip and the, the red one is the uh, rotational and the blue line is the continuous system. And always we have a higher uh, um, ground cover with the, with the rotational system in comparison with the with the um, continuous. Beside that, when we tested the soil, we found higher uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, man manganese, zinc, and copper in the soil uh, of the continuous system, higher than in the rotational. The animals, they had the same performance. We had about 1.6 pounds per, per pig per day and the feed intake was the same in the different systems. Uh, I think the silvopastoral systems they have a, a lot of potential for many different reasons and they have been wor uh, used traditionally in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal. This is also in, in Italy. There is a, a project in Europe using the, this system, the silvopastoral system. They are testing uh, energy crops, a tree, the poplar and willows. And the, advantage, the main advantage that I see is that there is less risk of losing nutrients from, this, from, from the system. Um, Another option is to diversify the products of the, of the farm. If we can collect the bedding, we can either vermicomposting or we com can compost and we can have a valuable product to sell. And sometimes uh, this is very pricey, the vermicompost, the manure. So uh, it's, it's another source of income for the farm. We have to explore marketing, mar new markets and Dr. Talbot was working with charcuterie. We had the, the, the feeling that this will be a good fit for pasture pig production system. And for marketing, we have to explore new venues, new, new options. Another thing that we have to consider is that usually when, when these systems are analyzed, they result from an environmental stand of view. They are not um, so sustainable. But I think, and other people agree with me, that these evaluation are not considering all the benefits 
that this system can provide to the human. So if we will be um, including these kind of services uh, like soil health, biodiversity, and the benefits that they do to the communities um, maybe will be more fair and maybe farmers can receive a payment like happening in some countries uh, where farmers can receive payment for carbon sequestration and, and I think that's it.